Hey guys, and welcome to the Real Estate Jam podcast. We have a really great episode today with the one and only Bill Allen. Bill Allen is the uh, leader of the Seven Figure Flipping podcast. He is also a military veteran and uh, really an all around great guy. He does a lot of giving back and he's a pretty successful real estate in- investor operating a company that earns over $3 million a year. Uh, he has a lot of high level tips, but uh, in this episode, we kind of talk about how he got his start and where, where he's going. There's a ton of value packed into every um, bit of this show. So if you if you have your notepad and pen, you can take some notes, listen to it again if you need to. Make sure you share the podcast, subscribe, like it, and send it to all your friends. It's it's really a great episode. They don't want what we know out there. How a person can go from really almost nothing to becoming a millionaire by owning rental property. He would always buy these flip houses, and I just remember thinking, this guy is crazy. Why would he buy that house? In the past decade, there's been a huge surge in the peer-to-peer short-term rental market. Become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get the game. Every second counts. So make every second count. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam. Whether you're just beginning or the best of the best, we're glad you're here. We will share successes, failures, and strategies for the action-taking real estate investor. And now to your hosts, JD, Annabelle, and Melissa. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for being with us today. Uh, we are proud to welcome Bill Allen. He, if you don't know who Bill is, he is the visionary leader of the Seven Figure Runway and the Seven Figure Altitude Mentorship Program. He is the owner of Blackjack Real Estate. He's also a member of the U.S. Navy Reserve, and he's a mentor to thousands through his podcast, Seven Figure Flipping. Thanks for being with us, Bill. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's a that's a great introduction. I was wondering what you were going to say because you know I didn't even give you guys anything, so it was really nice to to hear that. So um, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. I uh, get to do this from time to time now on my own podcast, so it's nice to uh, have an interview with somebody else and they're asking me questions. This can be fun. Awesome, Bill. Well, just so you know, you're our first live interviewee. So so cut us a break if we're not hitting the right notes. Um, so. I think there's going to be a lot of people that listen to us who know who you are, but, but there's going to be some that don't. Can you kind of give us a rundown of your investing history and where you came from and how you got to where you're at now? Yeah, absolutely. And first, it's an honor to be your first guest. I'm excited. Uh, I think I have a little bit of pressure there. So let's see if I can perform, right? So I, um, so I was a military guy. I was an aviator. So I, I got out of Georgia Tech. I went, did ROTC. I got commissioned into the Navy. It was in 2003. I actually went to graduate school, got a master's in aeronautical engineering with, at Air Force Base. So I went up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for a year, then went down to flight school. I moved 15 times in those 15 or 16 years or so that I was active duty and flew helicopters and, and airplanes uh, for the Navy. And during that time, I was trying to figure out kind of in my investment strategy. I always, my dad always taught me to save money, to put aside 10% to be smart with what I was I was kind of taught to be a saver. So I was in the stock market, but it wasn't moving my net worth the way that I wanted it to. So that's when I started uh, investing in uh, actually just kind of educating myself in real estate. So podcast books, things like that. I had a library card and I used it like crazy. I was just reading all kinds of different investment books and getting to know what other people were doing and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So that led me to I kind of buy my own house. I actually had a CO in college at the ROTC. He said, at my ROTC unit, he said, I bought a house everywhere I was stationed and I always made money. And so I said, okay, great. So I bought this condo in San Diego for almost $400,000 in 2006. And I sold it in 2010 for 200,000. So I lost $185,000 on that condo and said, this guy is crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But um, fortunately there was a, an army program called HAP, Housing Assistance Program, that bailed me out of that. And I pretty much broke even on the house, fortunately, because I had moved there at the right time. So I didn't give up. I bought another house at the next duty station in Pensacola, and I fixed it up myself and then rented it out when I left. And then I did another one of those and then another one. And I wanted to get to 10 rentals. And I thought that would be my my retirement plan. 10 rentals making, you know, $10,000 a month, I'd be $120,000 and retire in the Navy. That was my plan. And then I got exposed to people who were doing crazy things in real estate, people who were 
flipping 150 houses a year and not going to see them. At first I thought they were lying. It was crazy. It couldn't happen. And until I got around them and that could just kind of change my mindset on things. We had a baby. We had our first son, Will, in Patuxent River, Maryland. And that's where I flipped my first house. We made $40,000 there. And then I went down to Pensacola after that. Did another one the next year. We made $43,000 on that one. And I said, wow, this is, this is more money than I make per year doing these two houses. Can we make this a business? And that's when I kind of, I joined a mentorship program and, and kind of took off from there and just got around other people. So I run a company now, uh, Blackjack Real Estate. I started it maybe four and a half years ago, five years ago. Started with just me and then it was one other person, then two people, then three people, then four. And we've grown to about 15 people. We will do close to we'll probably be under 3 million this year. Our, our target was three and a half million this year in, in gross profit. We probably do 35 to $40 million in real estate transactions total. And uh, we have a team of 15. They're awesome people spread all around kind of the Southeast. We're in Nashville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Pensacola, Florida. And then um, I just recently bought this mastermind group that you guys mentioned about four, four months ago. And so I do that as well. I got probably 10 people that work with us over there on that company. So I'm kind of the visionary of two different companies right now. And uh, I lend some money. I have a, uh, maybe 200 apartment building units. Uh, we're building some storage units down in Orlando, just doing all kinds of stuff with other people and just getting around people that are doing some really cool stuff. So that's kind of my life. Still fly for the Navy reserves. And I got out of the Navy about two years ago when I just, uh, it was time that I was going to stop flying. They were going to make me stop flying and I didn't want to stop flying. So got out of active duty, went in the reserves and I have three little kids, a five, three and one and a half. So they keep me busy. I didn't want to deploy and, and travel around and move a bunch anymore. And our middle son's special needs. He's had a bunch of open heart surgeries and stuff like that. So uh, he really takes a lot more attention of mine. So I wanted to be home with my family and do that stuff. So that's kind of my life. I have a real estate investment company. I have my personal investments in kind of apartment buildings and notes and hard money loans and stuff like that. The mastermind group, uh, part-time flying for the Navy and a family of five that we take care of. So it's a bunch of full-time jobs, it seems, sometimes. Well, I mean, that, that's amazing. It's kind of crazy to see how many different things that you're able to juggle at the same time. Uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the people you surround yourself with. But well, one of the things that, before we move on uh, that I wanted to ask about, that, that was actually the first time that I heard about your uh, uh, San Diego house housing extravaganza. I didn't realize that uh, you decided to buy a house at the exact wrong time in the in the market. Um, and I'm wondering, was your intention at that point to, to become this awesome real estate investor mentor coach, or you were just trying to survive? And then after you took a hit like that, what was it that pushed you to, to move forward and, and continue uh, through the, the struggle to, to find success? Okay. I think that's a great question. I've never really talked about this much other than the fact that it happened, right? So at that time, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I was, a, I was young. Let's see, I was, I was a Lieutenant JG, about to make Lieutenant. I had gone through flight school, just got my wings, went out to San Diego. And I was born there. I lived in Southern California when I was younger with my, my family and uh, moved away from there when I was in uh, kind of late, late, later in elementary school over to Maryland. So I love it there. I would move there tomorrow. It's so beautiful. And I want to go there every day. Every time I get off a plane in San Diego, I love it. So I had this kind of, I wanted to live in Pacific Beach. It's, it's a nice place. It, it was kind of the time where I was having more fun. I was going out and partying with my friends and stuff like that. You know, this young officer. I had a, a, a 2003 Ford Mustang Cobra convertible that I had bought when I was in Ohio. It was like my Ensign mobile, right? So stereotypes I, much. I love it. But you know, I had that, I had a pickup truck. I had to find a place to, to put the car. I didn't drive it that much. It was, I was spending money, right? I was, I was in a totally different mindset than I am right now. I didn't have a family. I didn't have anybody to take care of, take care of myself. And I could still save. I still saved about 25% of what I made, but I was spending a lot of money. So at that time, Getting a loan was very easy. It was signature loans, like crazy, no problem. I, I, couldn't, I didn't have any money to put a down payment on a house. So I got an 80% conventional loan and then I got a 20% second mortgage on it. So 100% financed house wow. with the signature, basically. Uh, I was making, I don't know, Ensign or JG probably makes somewhere around 60, maybe 65,000 a year, something like that. Um, so that's the kind of world and mindset that I was in. I had no idea. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just knew that People were buying houses like crazy at that time. They were buying things. 
to give you some idea of what this was, it's a $385,000 condo, 700 square foot, one bedroom condo. It's not, this wasn't a, like a 2,500 square foot house on the beach. This was a condo uh, on the second floor with, they said was a peekaboo view of the ocean. So you can kind of like look around. It looked at Ace Hardware in Pacific Beach. <laughs> Across the street was the VFW, which I frequented quite a bit when I was there. It was great. You can get like a dollar beer. And then you look around the corner and you can see a little bit of water over there by Tourmaline Beach. So it's about three blocks from the ocean. I looked at a ton of condos. I looked at a ton of different places while I was there. I couldn't afford a house. Those things were $800,000. So no, the answer is I had no idea who I was going to be. I had no idea what it was going to be. But I, so then I, I had this condo. I lived there. It was great. The location was fantastic. I wasn't even paying attention to the market. I had no idea that the market was like the sky was falling. It's just, I don't, I don't want, I just still don't watch the news. I didn't keep up with that stuff. It was just people started talking about that. I heard it. And I was like, ah, whatever. It's not a big deal. Then I went on deployment and I rented it out to somebody in my squadron while I was on deployment for like eight months. I was losing like $800 a month while I was on deployment, but I was still getting BAH and all the other stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a huge deal, but then when I got back, this person was still in there and I needed to find it. I couldn't even live in my condo when I got back, but I was supposed to go back on deployment two months later to go out to the air ambulance detachment in Kuwait and Iraq. And so I didn't think it was a big deal. So I moved in somewhere else. And then sure enough, the squadron said, hey, we need you at home. We need you to run the operations department and we're going to send somebody else on this deployment. We think it's too, too fast for you to operationally come off of a seven month deployment and go back on another six month deployment two months later. And it's just, we think it's a little bit unsafe. And I said, okay, if you guys need me at home, I'll stay at home. And so then I was, I was losing money every month as a landlord basically. And when I left to Pensacola, bought this other house, I still had it. I was losing $800 a month on this condo. And people say all the time, well, you know, if you kept it, that condo is selling right now for about 450 to $500,000 today. So I look and go, well, I sold it for 200. That person made 300. But I couldn't bleed $800 a month for, what, what has it been? That was uh, 2000, almost 10 years, yeah. seven, eight years. It's just, it wouldn't make financial sense and I wouldn't be able to do it. So, so no, I had no plan to become a real estate guy at that time. I didn't know what I was doing. I made a lot of mistakes, but I couldn't see what was coming. And all I could do is use that as a learning experience for what I'm going to do in the future. So that next house that I bought, I made sure that I was looking at the numbers. I was running the numbers on the rental rate if I did have to leave or if I got transferred or something happened to me. And so it changed. My, I got a really nice three bedroom, two bath house in Pensacola that I could rent out rooms if I needed to. And I knew that it would rent and I would make money on that house, maybe $500 a month after I left. So it made me smarter. Fortunately, if I had lost $185,000 on that deal and I didn't get bailed out by the government, if I, moved, if I moved there one month later in July instead of June in 2016, I would not have qualified for this. And so, and had I known I qualified earlier, I probably would have sold it a year or two earlier, frankly. Um, it was a friend of mine who was a realtor a friend, and a good friend who also owned a couple condos in that, uh, that area. He told me that, he, he, and he did it for me. He was my realtor. He pushed me through it. He showed me all the paperwork and stuff and really helped me out. So, so no, and dusting myself off, I, it's, it's not a big deal. I've lost $70,000 on a flip that I shared at Flip Hacking Live, actually, my story about it. And fortunately, we're running a business where that wasn't our only project that was going on and didn't put me under. You've got to be able to, you're going to get knocked down in this business. You've got to be able to get, get up, brush yourself off and, and get back to work. So um, yeah, I, I think hindsight, I, I wouldn't have changed anything. It was, it's part of my experience. It's part of my journey. I say this to people all the time. You, you look back and you say, man, I wish I didn't do that. Or I wish I had done this earlier. Or if I only started investing when I was 21, I would be a billionaire by now, right? Well, right. we're all on the journey that we're on for a reason. You need that experience. You need that. And I'm sure we're going to talk about building your team and things like that coming up, but you've got to be put in the place that you are right now, doing the things that you're doing and making those decisions and getting those learning experiences to get to the level that you need to get to. Like, uh, you know, I'm a follower of God and he's putting us on a path, a path that we need to go on in our, in our journey, in our experience. So all of these things that are happening to you that you think are negative, a lot of times turn out positive. I have so many stories of times where I'm sitting there like in tears. This is the worst thing that possibly could have happened to me. And then a year later, I see what, what has been done and I go, wow. And one big one was my grandmother just passed away. And in May of, la May of this year, we went to Africa. And we had a mastermind group meeting in Africa. We did, went on safari and did all this cool stuff. And 
on the way there, we, my wife and I got first class tickets and we had to fly to Washington DC to pick up our first class flight to Africa. It was going through London. My wife's mom has breast cancer right now. She had just found out and we were going to meet them in London for the day. And we flew, uh, so we get to, we flew to Washington DC and we had all this plan to get on the flight. We get to the flight and they go, you don't have tickets. And we said, what are you talking about? We don't have tickets. We use this travel agent that everybody else used. They got us tickets. They did everything. It was first class. T- we're in the lounge and they basically are treating us like we're bums. We don't have tickets. <laughs> and they, they can't figure out what happened. Well, sure enough, they, they, they booked it, but they never charged my credit card. So they dropped the ticket and I didn't even notice. So, so we're, my, my wife is like so upset. She's not going to see her mom the next day. We can't get on the flight. If we, we get on the flight, it's going to cost us like an extra $10,000 each to do it. I, I said, that's nuts. We go, we stay with my, we, they get us on the flight the next day. I have to pay an extra like three grand or something to get on the fl- same flight the next day. Her parents can't meet us the next day. They can only meet us that day. And so she's not going to see her mom. I'm devastated. I'm in tears. I feel like a failure as a husband and, and all of this stuff, right? Well, we go see my uncle. We stay at my uncle's house and we go have my grandmother and my mom just happen to be in town. And we go to lunch with, the next day with my grandmother and my mom. Um, and then we go on the flight, we get to Africa, everything's fine. It all worked out, but Lucy didn't get to see her mom. Well, my grandmother died a few months after that. And I never would have gotten to see her had that not happened. So I'm sitting there in the funeral, looking back on this whole journey and saying, this was by design. Like this happened for a reason. So I could see my mom and my grandmother in that time. And it's the same in our life and our, uh, our real estate business is I needed all the steps along the way to get to where I got to. So I know this is a long way around back to your question. And um, I, pro- I didn't ever expect to tell that story here, but it's a lot of people feel like they jump into this, they're in like failure mode or things are going wrong or they're getting knocked down or they're getting punched and they just feel like they're getting, they're getting torn up. And you, you've got to be positive through all that, push through it because on the other side of that is success. That's where it lives. And that's where all of those things you know, reside. You have to get through some of that stuff. So I had to go through a lot of different struggles and there's, it, it's journey hasn't been easy. People think it's, you're an overnight success when they've never heard of you. And then they hear you're doing a couple million dollars a year. So, um, anyway, that's my answer to your no, question. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's a, a great story. Thank you for sharing it with us. And I think, I think it's pivotal to let, especially newer investors know that it's not always sunshine and rainbows and that you got to take your lumps as you move through. And I think that resonates personally with us in our business, you know, and, and really every real estate investor, nothing comes easy and, and nothing's perfect the first go. So we appreciate, we appreciate that. Um, now, if, if you are moving from, from your first house into your, your next one, you started out doing everything yourself, right? Swinging the hammer, everything. Uh, and that's the same experience we had. Uh, what, what pushed you to change from, from needing to, to do everything yourself because you're saving money to realizing that um, you save more money and get a quicker return when you hi- start hiring stuff out? So... That house that I bought in 2009 in Pensacola, I figured out how to renovate. I just, the, the bathroom in the master was beautiful, reno, fully renovated. And the one in the spare was garbage. And I just said, I'm going to figure out how to do this. Watch YouTube videos, laid tie, ripped everything out. It was the time of these HGTV shows were starting to become popular, right? So I was watching those and I said, I can, if they can do this, I can do it. So I started ripping everything out and did that. Then I bought a house in in Maryland. And I had, a, there was a thousand square foot unfinished basement and I finished the entire thing myself. I didn't hang the drywall, but my six month pregnant wife was in the basement with me painting the walls. Uh, I, she had a, a really nice expensive respirator. Don't worry. <laughs> we took care of that. But, um, you know, we were doing, try, doing that ourselves and then we got that house rented out and then we bought that first renovation of ours and we did, I GC'd it. We did almost all the work. There was a, there was a GC that came in to help me, but there was some things that I said, I'm going to do this to save money. So just so the listeners know, this was probably 2009 to about, um, 2016, 15, 16, where I was doing all the work on everything. Basically I was doing it. I was doing one, maybe one house a year, maybe two rentals a year during that time. So it's, it wasn't like this was an overnight change in my mindset. The, the one thing that got me was when I got around people who had a team and I saw them sitting in a conference room at a mastermind meeting with me with their computers closed and their phones in their pocket. And I was getting emails from them about wholesale deals that they were trying to sell. And I said, well, who sent this? You know, it's, it's their team. You know, it's got their name on it, but they're not sending it. 
you guys might get an email from, from me today while I'm on this call. So the change for me was when I got around those people and I, I did a couple different exercises, write down all the things that you're doing right now and then write down how much money you made the last year and then how many hours you think you worked approximately and, and everything that you do. You know, uh, For me, it was rental income, it was investment income, dividends, stocks, things like that. It was, um, it was the flips, it was the W-2 income and then how many hours I worked and I did that math. And what I saw when I did it in, I think it was like 2015, it was $55 an hour. That, that's, that was my kind of my worth to the marketplace of everything that I was doing. And so then what, what I said is why, why do, why do I, if I can hire somebody to do these, some of these things that are on my task list, right? All the things that I'm doing, a lot of it was driving to Home Depot, putting lock boxes on houses, setting up utilities, things like that, where you can get an administrative office assistant or something like that to go do those things for $10, $12 an hour, at, definitely at that time. And so at $55 an hour, I shouldn't be doing that stuff. If I stop doing that stuff and start doing the $100 or $200 an hour tasks, and then the follow-on kind of uh, worksheet there is, Go figure out on that list, put a, put a number next to those tasks and what you think it sh- it's making you. And those, you know, putting lockbox on homes and setting up utilities and all that stuff, that's a $10 or $12 an hour job. And then you've got other things like following up with leads or, or do it, putting your direct mail in or marketing or, or setting up, you know, online advertising or negotiating contracts or going to find better contractors that are going to be faster or cheaper, all of those things, then those are $100 an hour, $200, $500 an hour tasks. And so you need to figure out how to, what I was doing was I was just doing whatever needed to get done, not the stuff that was going to make me more money. So if I can focus on those $500 an hour tasks, I can get my dollar per hour up to $100 an hour and bring in somebody at $12 an hour to offset that stuff. So that, that was kind of the mindset shift that I needed to understand what my value to the marketplace was and not discount it. And then also have to get over the fear of hiring somebody. So I remember my first call with my mentor, I said, I do not want to hire anyone ever. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of, you know, bringing somebody in and be responsible for them and their family, putting food on their table and all that stuff. What if I, what if I screw up? What if I, you know, my business doesn't become successful? What if I have to let them go after three months and shut the doors of the business? I don't know. It's probably like, 80% of small businesses fail in the first couple of years, right? Maybe, maybe it's even higher. It's, that's a stat I just pulled out of my back pocket, by the way. It's not official. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, so I, I was afraid of that. But what I wasn't doing is I wasn't being confident in myself and my ability and, and also my drive and my focus. And I wasn't, I knew I was, I knew I was a, a, a decent leader in the military, but there's so much security in all that. That I, and I have to be a leader there. Like I'm, I'm one of the senior officers uh, as I'm uh, you know, moving up the ladder. I have to be a leader there. When you come over here and take on something yourself, it's this unknown, it's scary, it's all of those things, right? So you just have to change the way that you think and, and try it and not be afraid, like we talked about in your last question, to fail. It's okay. And, so, and also being upfront and honest with those people that, hey, this is, this is a new venture that, I, that, I, that I'm doing. I'm excited about it and you have to cast the vision for them. So that, that was kind of this change in my mind. And I was also like, I was going crazy. I was working nonstop for one deal a year when there was somebody else on a podcast saying he's doing 150 deals a year and he's not looking at any of the houses. And so I, I kind of asked myself, is this possible? Is it really possible to do? And then I said, I want to just get around those people and, and meet them and see if it is. And when I met them, they're normal people just like me. They're really great people and they're honest, they're trustworthy, they're, they're loyal, they have integrity, all that stuff. And I said, wow, that, this is possible. So, and it took, it took me listening to more than one podcast to, to get that, right? I, it was probably like six months of me listening to this while I'm driving to a job site that nobody is showing up at. And then I'm going to my, my full-time job and then I'm coming back and nothing was done that day. So I have to stay there for two hours to lay some tile or do whatever they were supposed to do that got screwed up. So the next guy, when he was coming in, had things done and then I wasn't coming home to my family and it was driving me nuts. So I eventually went crazy and spent a bunch of money and got around the people that were doing that. So that's kind of was my journey and it's hard as a, if you're listening to this and you're new and you're like, ah, I just, I, I'm afraid to hire somebody. Me too. We all are. We all were. It's there's not a single person that has a big company right now that one day wasn't sitting in their garage or their office or somewhere in their house going, should I really do this? I'm a little bit scared to do this. And that's okay. If you're not scared, 
that that's probably when you get into a little bit of a problem. But it, it seems like now you've gotten over that fear, blown that that fear out. When we were sitting in in the room, flip hacking live, we had 650. I think it was was your your final number of people there, and every single person in that room looked at your team when they were on stage and said, "I want them to be on my team. How do I get a team like that? How do I build that?" whatever that is. And it's not really quantifiable, but it's a team culture. And I'm wondering if you could go into a little bit of uh, building your team and building that uh, culture based off of your core values and, and how, how you're finding those people, how you're getting them to buy into your vision and, and how, how you transformed your mindset from somebody who's afraid to hire to somebody who has a team that literally everybody in the room wanted to have. And, and Bill, before you um, answer that, I just wanted to cut in here and say a lot of our listeners are going to be at that point where they're leveling up. Part of leveling up is scaling their business and so making that first hire. And so if you could also piggybacking on what JD said, talk about what is a good first hire. What is the best first hire? Is it a marketing cold caller? Is it an admin person? What is your advice to those that are at that point that they're ready to do that hire? Okay, let's let's start there and then I'll move on to the the, the further things. So I'm just writing some things down because I was like, man, there's a lot to unpack there, right? <laughs> let's, just, let's just buckle in for another hour. And so the I think the first, the first person that you hire, so I was in a position where I had a full-time job and I knew that I was going to be flying all day and I was going to start doing some marketing. And so as I was doing this marketing, I needed somebody to answer the phone because I knew that in, in my network at that time, a lot of people were sending direct to voicemail and some people were answering live. And what we found was the live answer people were, were seeing a way better return, way better uh, income than the people who were just sending people to voicemail and then following up because they couldn't get a hold of a lot of those people. So, so I knew that somebody, for me, the structure and setup of my business and the way where I was going, it would be somebody like an office manager. We also had a couple flips going on where we were buying a foreclosure auction. So setting up the utilities, doing the bookkeeping, uh, putting lockboxes on, doing all that stuff, it was important. Um, and then somebody get to an appointment if you got a really hot appointment to go out there. So this kind of catch all person for me. And that was my first hire. What I tell a lot of people now is you don't, you're not me, right? You're you. So what are your unique abilities? What is your skill set? What does your business look like right now? And where do you want to take it? And then bring that person on that, that it's like a puzzle. If you look at two pieces of a puzzle, they just got to fit, right? So my puzzle piece and your puzzle piece are going to look very different to see how they're going to fit together with another person. So I needed that support you might need something else. Like you said, if they're cold calling, they might need someone to come on and be a cold caller for them. That might be their first hire. Or maybe what you're doing is you're, you're a, just a pure flipper and you're networking with wholesalers and then you need a project manager to come in to help you with the renovation projects. So maybe your first hire is a project manager. Maybe you are horrible with the books and bookkeeping and your first hire is going to be a bookkeeper because you're sitting there doing all these Excel spreadsheets and you, or you're not keeping track of receipts and anything. You don't even know how much money you're making in your business and you're really good at the other things. So everybody's going to be a little bit different. I think the best advice that I can give you is try to get to know yourself a little bit. It took me four years, three or four years to really get to know myself to the point where I know all of my strengths and weaknesses. Well, most of them, I find some, uh, some weaknesses from time to time, <laughs> but I'm also become, have become okay with them. So that was the hardest thing for me, JD. You asked about in the beginning, how, how to give those things up. The hardest thing is to, is to be okay with the fact that you're not good at things and not just try to hold on to everything. I tried to hold on to everything for a long time because I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of a little bit of the perfectionist. I have some detail orientation to me. So with that comes nobody, I'm not sure if anybody's really as good at this as what I'm doing or they, it's not, it might not even be that they're really as good at it, but they might not care as much as me. Right. Because it's my company and I care a lot more and we can modify to do lots of different things outside of our normal, who we are as business owners. And we have to, a lot of times there's stuff that I don't like to do and I'm not good at that. I have to do it's too bad. Suck it up. I'm the owner. I have to do it like get in front of 650 people on stage and make it seem like I really, that's what I love to do. And I was born to do. It's not frankly. Um, so, but I, I do like to do it. And I, we are talking about things that I really love so I can do it. So 
with all of that to be said is if you're looking to hire your first person and say who that is, don't listen to anybody else who is saying, this was my first hire. This was my first hire. This is how I did it. Unless if, if I resonate with you and you're like, oh man, everything that he's saying, I'm doing all of that stuff. I'm just like that. I have a full-time job. I have all this. I'm good here. I'm not good here. Then fine. Hire that office manager and, and bring them on. But everybody's going to be a little bit different. Get to know yourself a little bit. Take one of these personality profiles. The DISC assessment is free. It's really good. Um, good starting place for you to figure out who you are. Like I'm a really high D. I'm a really low I. I'm an even lower S. And then I'm a like a moderate C, if you guys know what that is. I'm a 99D, like almost just pure drive, pure ego, like hopefully the good ego. Um, <laughs> I'm, not very, I'm not very people person. I'm like a 40 on the, on the I 35, somewhere around there. And then my S is really low. So like I want stuff done like a week ago and I didn't even tell you about it. Yeah. So, um, and then my, my C, I have some detail. I'm like 60, 65, somewhere around there. So it kind of comes back. So that's kind of who I am. So I know that I need somebody who's a little bit different than me. I can't have somebody who's as driven as me, as my uh, personal assistant. I need, and I need, but I need somebody who's fast, fast acting. Otherwise they'll just, I'll blow right by them. If they're a 99 C or 99 S I'm going to go crazy because they're so slow. I need stuff done fast. So think about all that stuff and how those puzzle pieces fit together. So that's my, that's my recommendation to people who are hiring their first person is take that list that you created of all the tasks that you're doing, take the things that you shouldn't be doing or you're not good at, or you don't want to be doing. And that are $10, $12, even $50 an hour tasks and move them over to and create that job description that way. And that's kind of the person that you want to hire. So your, your list is going to look a lot different than me because you're probably doing a lot of different things than me. So, and then uh, obviously there's, there's money and time capacity and stuff like that. What can you afford? Be realistic and, and, and a little bit conservative about that. But the other thing to think about for, for recommendation is you guys don't have to have their entire salary in the bank right now. But you also don't want to have to make a deal the first month to pay for them the next two or three months. So be responsible with, don't wait too long to hire, but don't hire too, too early. So I realize people are like, oh man, what, just right? What is this? It's like the three little bears. So you, you've, you'll, you'll know if you're at a capacity where you can't do anymore. So here's, here's my example. I would go to one of these mastermind meetings or one of these, uh, I would go out of town or I'd have a, a busy flying week and I'd say, I'm not marketing this week because I can't take the calls. And I would shut it down for a week and then I'd come back the next week and I'd get so inundated and catching up in the office stuff that I'd go, oh crap, I forgot to send my list to the mail house. And that's week two. And that now week three, I finally send the list to the mail house and it takes another week for the mail to go out. So that's three week gap basically of when I mailed last. And it was this kind of marketing cycle that wasn't consistent because I was always missing the deadlines because I had too much stuff going on. I was overloaded. So and I don't like answering the phone and talking on the phone. So I wouldn't send as much mail as I could. So I didn't turn up the dial because I didn't want more calls. I go, I can't take that more. But then when I hired somebody to take the phone calls, I didn't care how high I turned that dial. I was just like, crank it up and just let her get crushed. And then, then it was the appointment struggle. I was having to go on appointments and I was flying all the time. So I couldn't go on appointments. And then we hired somebody to go on the appointments. And it was just organic growth, person after person to where I was at max capacity. So Andy told me this, Andy McFarland is, is one of my mentors in the beginning of, of all this. And he's, he had a great analogy is it's a cup of, cup of water, right? Your, your cup's filling up and it's overflowing. You just need to bring in another cup to put under that cup to start filling that cup up and empty some of your cup into that cup. Now you have two cups that are half full. Now your cup is going to start overflowing and their start, cup's going to start filling up. When your cup starts overflowing, find another cup in a different position and start emptying your cup into there. And you, your people will tell you when they're, or you'll know when they're at max capacity because they won't be doing a good job. They're great people, but they're maxed out and they're missing things. And it's because they're redlining and they're not going to tell you that they're redlining, but that's a story for another day. So that's my first hire. That's kind of my, my advice to everybody. And then how did I build my team? You said, we got these people on stage. I know, I knew that was going to happen. You got people who are sitting in the audience who don't have anybody on their team who go, I want a Chad in my sales department. I want, I want a Ashley. I want a Val answering my phones. Well, I'm going to give you guys something that we didn't talk about on stage at Flippacking Live, you're not going to get a Chad and a Val on your first go. It's just, you cannot, you can't bring them in. We talk, we started this, this conversation from a standpoint of you're on a journey and you're on a path. My journey was not, I got to hire Val and I got to hire Chad and then I got to hire Ashley and then I got to hire Heather and then Nate and my whole team was perfect. It just doesn't work that way. You have to, you need to hire the person that's right for you now. 
And that person, like your ad should not say, I'm looking for an entry level person who can help me in the office who will be around for somewhere between six and nine months to help me grow this thing and scale this thing. And once it becomes successful, I may outgrow you. <laughs> okay. That is not the way to interview people or to, but looking back, I, I never thought this way. And I even hesitate sometimes to tell people to think this way because what I was doing is I was hiring people that I wanted to lead, that I wanted to be part of my team. They had the, quali- they had the qualifications, they had the mindset, they had the core values that, that I shared at that time. And as we grew as a company, we grew in different directions, some of us. And that's okay. Some of those people that work with me in the beginning are running their own companies right now that are very successful. Some of those people are, you know, found, found something else that they really love to do. They made good money here and they decided they wanted to go do something else. Or we terminated their employment because they weren't a good fit. So there's lots of different things that happen. But I'll tell you, those people that weren't a good fit that we had to part ways with, they are, this was not a good position for them. They were not in a place that they flourished, that they would do a good job in, that they fit. It wasn't the right person for the right seat. And hopefully now looking back, they say, I appreciate the fact that they didn't hold on to me too long because now the job that I'm in right now, I really like it a lot more and I'm more successful and I'm thriving in there. So they're all good people. We wouldn't hire them if we didn't think they were good people, but they just need to be somewhere else. So I think you said, how do you get them to buy into your vision and how do you grow a team like that? So for my, my, my advice to you guys is wherever you're at right now, wherever you are, figure out who that person you need is and then go out and find somebody that you mesh with. Somebody who is, you mentioned culture, core values, you said all that stuff. It's important for you to find somebody that fits your core values. So if I have to get you to buy into my vision, like you said, how do you get them to buy into your, your vision? That was your question. That you're the wrong person if I have to get you to buy into my vision. If you don't show up, and want to get on this bus and get on this ride, even when, and I use this example a lot because my first salesperson I ever hired, we met in Denny's in Pensacola, right on, I think it was like, uh, I don't know, right there by I-10. And in a, in a Denny's, we met there and she could just, she just wanted to get on the ride. She wanted to go on this path with me. I was, I was telling her what I was going to do, where I wanted to go, all that stuff. And she wanted to be a part of it. And I didn't have to close her. I didn't have to, she was actually, she actually closed me. She negotiated a, a better pay and stuff like that. And that's when I said, okay, this is a pretty good salesperson. She's negotiating <laughs> me up in rate. And so for me, I, she wanted to get on, get on the ride. And she, she, was on, she was on there with me for like two years. And it was great. She did a great job. Um, she's excellent. But when we got to the point, we just kind of grew in different directions and she wanted to do something different. And I saw it. I saw it happening and it's okay. But I didn't have to sell her. And I think if you have to sell somebody, but you also have to know your vision. You have to believe in it. You have to understand yourself, know what kind of core value person you want. And in your gut, if you feel like this is the wrong fit or something's not right, or you don't want to, you don't want to spend Christmas dinner with this person or, or hang out with them or get to know them a little bit in the beginning of a company, that's really important. You got to like the people that you work with because this is a small company. We're very kind of tight and close. Even now, even with 15 people, we, we all, I would, I'd have every single person in my company over for dinner at my house, spend time with my kids, leave them alone with my kids while my wife and I went out to dinner. No problem. No questions asked. They're just all really great people. And I want to be around them. And I think that's a big thing when you're starting to grow even a small company, a small startup. If there's, there's gotta be a lot of trust there. Um, so that's kind of, I think, let's see, buy into my vision, core values, core values are really important too, but uh, getting to know yourself, I think is the first step. And then kind of that position that you hire and then, and then just going on that journey, not, not thinking that, that this is a chat or this is a Val or those are the te- my team members for you, those of you guys listening who weren't at Flip Hacking Live, but it, you have to realize that you're not going to get that $200,000 a year pharmaceutical salesperson when you're not doing any deals. And that's okay. You don't need that person. You need somebody to help you out. You need somebody to take those tasks off your plate, somebody who's good and somebody who fits you. So don't, you know, don't go read like, top grading and think you need to hire like the best rock star person right out of the gate and you're going to pay a ton of money. I found my CEO, my, this team is a work in progress from five years. So I knew that was going to happen because we finally have what I think is obviously the best team that we've ever had. And the one piece of advice I will give is don't treat them like a family, treat them like a team. 
because the family always has those people who don't care about like they're they got the drunk uncle who's going to drive drunk home from a holiday party or something and it's okay because it's you know uncle jimmy but you've got you on a team on a super bowl winning high performance team they won't let you do that because you're going to let the team down so that was the mindset that i had for years was i'm building a family and really what i wanted to build was a team and i think the way that you cultivate that is you do some team building things, you make it fun and exciting in the office and, and ho- however you do business, whether it's virtual or in the office, and you've got to build that team up and, and build that culture and build it around you and your core values and your culture and make sure that it's fun. Like we do a Christmas party every year. We do, we play fun games. So I give out a bunch of money. I give out laptops and stuff like that. Like we, if we do really well, we, I, I try to figure out how I can spend the most money on my team and my staff then on a nice venue and all that other stuff. Like I want to make them feel like, whoa, this is awesome. We, we do really cool stuff and our quarterly meetings are fun and we do some meetups and I, I try to, you know, help them with their personal finances and get on a monthly call with them about that and just make them feel like I really care about them because I do. So anyway, long answer, I think. But if I didn't hit any of that, let me know. No, I no. think that's absolutely beneficial. Um, I think that, you know, it's funny because you, we asked us, what audience are you targeting? And so many of the things you said really resonated with what we are currently going through, you know, what we are learning every day. Um, so we really appreciate your time today. Do you have, is there anything else you'd like to touch on or anything that we left out? Melissa, JD, anything you guys wanted to relook at? Thank you so much, Bill. You, um, gave so much good information to really, uh, multiple levels of, where people might be in their journey. So it was just fabulous. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we're, we're huge fans of yours and uh, we love how much value you bring, not just to your podcast, but uh, to the people that attended Flip Hacking Live. There were so many people that I talked to that had their own individual personal story uh, with you. I really appreciate how vulnerable you are when you're up there talking, letting people know that it's not perfect. That's something that really resonates with us. Uh, and even, even today, letting us know that you're, you're not just this automatic success story, that it's building blocks and you're stepping up and stepping up and stepping up until you reach a level of success that uh, most people, most real estate investors dream to achieve. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you've uh, taken today to, to have this conversation with us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I had a good time. I'll say that, uh, you know, this journey, it's just a business. It's a business owner, right? It, this, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started, if you're running a huge company, if, even if you have a bagel shop or a, a bakery or whatever you do, a shoe store. It's, it, the fundamentals of business are the fundamentals of business. It's people, right? It's about getting to know the people, taking care of your people. Everything that we do, if it surrounds the people and you actually care and it's obvious and you're authentic, then it's going to shine through what you're doing. So, it's the, it's the people that show up that sign this on the hood of the car, pressure sales, those kind of things that don't make it very far. Screwing people over, not doing the right thing. It's, it just goes back to, you know, do unto others as you would want done unto you. And if you can do that, then you're going to be successful in this life and business. You're, every time you get knocked down, you're going to get back up. Don't let other people affect you the way that they, they try to in a negative fashion. And, and spend your time with good people like this. You know, you're listening to this podcast, you, you, you know, you're in the right place. You're listening to the right, the right thing. You're, you're ingesting the right information for you to be successful. So that's my advice to everybody is just, you know, get out there and take action, obviously, and, and find, find the right crew for you, like the right people that you want to be around. And it's really cool to see all of the people, like you said, JD, at, at the, the event that we had, they're, they're all very alike. You know, everybody there was having a great time, getting to know each other, asking questions. And that those, those couple people who felt out of place, you know, it's, it's probably not the event for them, you know, and it was just figuring out how to attract the people. And that's the best thing that I can give for advice of building a team. And what you guys have going on right now too, is put out, put, put out what you guys want to attract and you're going to attract the right people and they're going to come you know, knocking on your door like crazy, wanting to work there. And I always had a saying in my company is I wanted I wanted everybody to come knocking on our door, trying to get a job working with me and working with us, but they can't because we're full <laughs> and because nobody wants to leave. So if you can create a culture and, and a company like that, you're, you're doing, you're doing really well and the money will follow, the deals will follow. And you're right. We're not perfect. I have problems on a regular basis. Every single day, there's things that blow up and, <laughs> and you know, a lot of people aren't talking about that stuff. Everything looks really good. Like the sunshine and butterflies, like you mentioned, but you know, 
being authentic and being real and, and sharing those struggles and those problems, that's where, that's where you're going to impact a lot of other people because everybody, the, the second that in a room of 20 people, one person raises their hand and said, hey, I got this thing going on. I don't really want to talk about it, but I'm, I'm sharing it and I need some help. 10 other people in that room are going to go, I'm going through the exact same thing. I didn't want to share it. And yes. that's the biggest thing is if we can focus on the problems, the issues that we have, work on them, be better. And uh, other people will, will jump in and, and thank you for it because they're afraid to, to ask the same question. And that's, I think the shift that we're trying to make in, in the mastermind program, the, the podcast, all those things. So I appreciate you guys having me on. I had a lot of fun. Uh, it just gives me a, um, I'm excited for you guys building this podcast, building your business, doing all the things that you guys are doing. Um, is really cool. Really cool to see. Awesome. awesome. Bill, is there any, anywhere, uh, that people can reach you or look more into your company and, uh, do you have, you, you have any, uh, upcoming events that you want to share? Um, yeah, you, you guys can, you guys can check out like my team and my staff. I think there's an about us page on the website. I built the website myself from scratch and then I hired a marketing officer and she deleted the whole thing and redid it. And like, <laughs> it, it took me six, like six months to build and she redid it in like two days. So it's a, uh, that, that company one is blackjackre.com. So blackjackre, like real estate, that's our uh, investment company. And then sevenfigureflipping.com. You can check us out there. We're revamping that website. It's going to be really cool when it launches here in a couple weeks. And, um, uh, obviously, you can listen to the, the podcast, Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. But uh, we, we do an event called Flip Hacking Live every year, and it's out in San, San Diego. Um, we've done it four years in a row. It's in October every year. So uh, I think it's a great event. You guys obviously were there. You checked us out. I uh, appreciate that. And, and we'll be um, there again. We'll see you next year, 2020. Awesome. Awesome. So I can't wait for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I think it's flip, just flippackinglive.com. So you can check that out. I don't know if we have next year's tickets on sale or anything. It's, they are. We do? Okay. Yes. So you can go there and check it out. So um, yeah, that's an event that I absolutely love. You're right. We had about 600 people there, I think, this year. And uh, I'd like to you know, just find, you know, get out to some more people that next year. I think the biggest thing is just make an impact on somebody. If somebody can go to that event and leave better than they came, that's all we care about. So, um, that's it. So yeah, that's us. And you can check us out wherever and send us some messages. You can, uh, send us a message on the Facebook, uh, uh, pages that we have or, or the website. So awesome. Thanks again, Bill. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. And you guys did great, by the way. First podcast, awesome questions. You guys are awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Jam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, check out our website, shorefrontrestorations.com, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Shorefront Restorations. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email at info at shorefrontrestorations.com. See you next episode.